Okay, so what do blockchain and socialism have to do with each other? Blockchain and socialism are quite different things, right? Socialism, we're talking about really a, um, a socioeconomic system uh, where workers own the means of production of the economy. So we have democratic workplaces. Um, we have democratic input to the economy and the way that we use and distribute resources. And blockchain is just sort of a technology that you can, I think, it is interesting in that you can embed uh, political values within uh, sort of technological code or software. For everything that is problematic in the crypto world or blockchain space, I think one of the things, one of the more interesting things about it that I'm wanting to sort of dig into more and more is how can we use this technological medium, which opens up, I think, a very interesting uh, way for people to think about how our economy is designed in the first place. It's a time when you could feasibly think about um, what does a socialist economy look like uh, through the lens, of course, of kind of a tech of software um, in a way that is much more legible than sort of like just looking at the economy from afar. Um, so I think there are ways that we can then, if socialism is about sort of democratic ownership of our resources, of our workplaces, uh, I think blockchain is an interesting tool for facilitating exactly that. The old world is ending. And we have the opportunity to rethink everything. This is a show about the systemic problems in our world. And the real solutions we have today. To transition from an apocalyptic storm of war, scarcity, and ecological collapse. To create an abundantly advanced collaborative society. That sustains all life. You may think it's an impossible dream. But the alternative is an inevitable nightmare. We're your hosts, Matt Holton. Amanda Smith. And Zachary Marlowe. And together, we can move past this economic absurdity and come together to actualize our collective potential to create something completely new. We are Mindless Society. Welcome to the show, y'all. We are <laughs> coming to you live <laughs> from the Crypto Commons Hub. Actually, hang on. Am I peeking? Am I too loud for the mic? No, we're just fine. I'm here with <laughs> Josh, the blockchain yeah. socialist. We just finished out an incredible, one of a kind, totally unique, completely beautiful, radical, weird, sense-making and nonsense-making <laughs> conference uh, here in the hills. These aren't quite the Alps of Austria. They're the hills of uh, about crypto, all things rethinking money, rethinking governance, uh, rethinking the technological systems that shape our consciousness. It's just been a wonderful time. Josh, tell us a little bit about the conference. Yeah, sure. So um, we are at the Commons Hub, which um, is a place where we host an event called the Crypto Commons Gathering, which was the, right, I think the one that just happened was the third sort of iteration, the third annual um, event. It started, of course, two years ago um, with my friends Julio and Felix. Um, Felix is doing a PhD in sort of thinking about crypto in through the lens of the commons. Um, so you've been doing a lot of like really interesting research uh, with a couple of different projects like Common Stack and a couple of others. And he basically, from what I understand, just like invited a bunch of the people that he interviewed from his thesis. Um, and invited us to a bunch of a bunch of people here, and of course, I had my uh, blog and podcast called the Blockchain Socialist, and he had invited me as well to come. We're gonna we're gonna investigate that. Yeah, in a little bit. Sure. But I, I just uh, I completely lucked into this. I have been trying to connect with people with the Holochain team for a while. Been very interested in mutual credit, in the regenerative finance community, in making connections to this quite wonderfully aligned, radical, beautiful, vibrant, cerebral community. And I just was trying to get an interview with like one of the people from Holochain and ended up getting invited to this conference. 
thought it was next month, was, was thought I had plenty of time. I was talking to Moritz on the phone. He's like, no, no, it's happening now. Like, let's get you out here. So I immediately took a train like eight hours from Germany to here. And uh, I'm, I'm a newcomer into this space in a lot of ways. So for me, this was like rushing. I had the fast pass, you know, like in Six Flags, like I got straight to Space Mountain or whatever. And uh, <laughs> I've, I've just loved every minute of it. It's been fantastic. So um, you fit right in, to be honest. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> like you, this is a place like I would, you know, um, for some people, if you like need a little bit of preparation before they come because of the types of just like conversations and very niche interests of a lot of people uh, kind of intersect. So niche. <laughs> it's, been, it's been awesome. Yeah, like, yeah. There's been so many conversations where I've been a little apprehensive. Well, not really that many, but a few like early in was where I was like, yeah, I want to create this uh, uh, application, this ecosystem of applications for gift economy that connects us with this and is the scalar f fractal self self-organizing system of circles within circles that uh, ultimately connects us to our highest purpose, connecting people with people, creating circles that scale out and become nodes in a smaller circle that scale out into nodes that the smaller circle that allows us to have coherence or you know distributed governance. And everybody is just like, yeah, what do you mean? Like that's what we're that's what we do every day. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. It's been really um, refreshing and just like so, uh, like the Grinch's heart has grown two sides, you know. Um, just seeing how many people are out here really like that they're in this crypto space that so many people assume is all about tokens and NFTs and that it's a big scam. Um, I know so many programmers who have these post capitals values um, who. Uh, are just completely dismissive of crypto. They don't, they're not interested in the cutting edge information technology because of the association and the stain that it has. So I yeah. um, would love to hear uh, more about uh, your book and sure. your whole ethos, the blockchain socialist. I mean, that's so many people is a contradiction in itself. Yeah, yeah. And you, you wrote a book called uh, Blockchain Radicals. Um, we're going to hold up the yeah. book and, and get oh, I should have brought a copy of it. <laughs> Blockchain radicals. How, 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 how capitalism ruined crypto and how to fix it. Yeah. How? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, so maybe to answer the other question uh, with the blog and podcast was, um, yeah, I mean, the name really, I made it and thought that I was going to change it <laughs> afterwards. Um, when I made it, I didn't really know what to call myself. It was sort of like, well, I know what I want to talk about, but I, you know, it sounded very, it's, it's like very on the nose, <laughs> obviously. I love it. Um, but I didn't want to be like, you know, whatever, Shadow Wolf 69, and then, you know, <laughs> I'm talking about this stuff. Um, so yeah, so it, 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 would, it turned out to be um, something that like really turns people's heads because they don't associate like, uh, you know, socialism in particular as a political ideology uh, in the blockchain space or with crypto, since it is, crypto is generally seen as like a very, hyper speculative and like very um, like free market fundamentalist type of thing to to go after or to be just like to be interested in. Um, so, yeah, I tried to bring uh, sort of an alternative lens and framework for understanding the technology through just like explicitly political left wing point of view. Um, but yeah, so I was doing that. I did that for uh, I have been doing it now for over three years and sort of in, you know, Having done it for a while, I kind of just got like a random message from uh, Repeater Books, which is a publisher in the UK. They um, are well known for um, being associated with Mark Fisher, who wrote Capitalist Realism. Um, so they write a lot of kind of like uh, radical left-wing philosophy, kind of somewhat esoteric uh, kind of books. So they're willing to take on the risk of exploring the types of uh, things that in a lot of kind of left-wing political discourse may not necessarily get very much attention to. Yeah, Mark Fisher is uh, one of the greats, really, an unfortunate loss. Yeah. He wrote uh, Capitalist Realism, which is the basic idea, you know, at, at, that Margaret Thatcher beautifully expressed that there is no alternative, Tina, that we cannot imagine our way out of capitalism. And um, yeah. so, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting uh, coming together of these two um, seemingly disparate fields that I, I feel like uh, when I kind of moved past that um, uh, gut level, like need to vomit of people like trying to create microtransactions for their friend groups or mm. monetizing monkey pictures. But I don't know, I, I just, I feel like for a long time, like I, I rounded a curve on crypto and was just like, this isn't any faker than any other money. Like it's all fake. <laughs> it's all something that's a socially constructed value that, you know, gains uh, power 
through reification and, you know, often, well, historically through the use of the state and taxation and the violence of colonialism and all these other things sure. that push us toward being, uh, needing, needing to embrace a um, anti-capitalist, post-capitalist, um, leftist, uh, a value system of, of a consciousness that pushes that technology to do what it can do. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like, I think we, we were talking about this the other day, but like, the ultimate scam, like, uh, underneath whatever scam you're thinking of now about crypto, the bigger scam is capitalism itself, um, leading us to think many different things that don't really align with human nature to begin with. Um, human nature is, we're greedy and inquisitive. We like to fuck <laughs> people over, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's human nature to deprive healthcare of children, right? Uh, very uh, natural. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a, it's a great point that um, in capitalism, everything's a scam. Healthcare is a scam. A fucking apple becomes a scam. And there's this inherent shadow sort of drive or incentive for people to be duplicitous, for people to lie, for people to dupe other people. And it's all based on a speculative bubble, based on money that's basically created out of nothing. And as a, a good friend of mine pointed out, like we are, we were formed in our creator's image. And so we have this economy that's all about speculation, grifting, duping people. Uh, it's not necessarily based on real value. It's not pegged to any objective physical referent. Uh, and so, so many people within that system in no matter what field they're in, no matter what technology they're working in, whether they're selling weapons or they're selling flowers, they have an incentive to dupe other people and be like, no, no, this is the best thing. This is the thing. You've got to get this thing. You know, so uh, crypto is just uh, it, the way it's been interpreted, you know, which is um, actually Good question. How would you define crypto? You can define socialism. I've uh, done that before, but how would you yeah, define yeah. crypto? And what is what is uh, the umbrella that is crypto? So crypto is uh, a couple of things. I mean, originally, crypto was referring to cryptography, and cryptography being kind of like this very fancy type of computer science, mathematical kind of field of study on how do you hide information or how do you send information to people without having people that you don't want to receive the information know about it. So it was like a really important, especially during like different wars, like World War II especially, it was really big because you wanted to send messages using radio. Uh, you don't want, because anybody can have like a radio receiver, you know, um, if you use like, if you use different codes, then you can like encrypt messages in, um, in something that looks like nonsense, but to where the other party is the only one who knows how to decrypt that message and then get the information. So like, we'll get you know. back to nonsense. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not, yeah. Um, but uh, so yeah, so the comp uh, really, um, you know, in, in World War II, they use like Native American languages code and yeah, code talkers. So it, there is a lot of um, different techniques uh, that like people had already been using for a long time anyways. And then cryptography was like this kind of like mathematical field of study that kind of studied this in a more abstract way. And then with computers makes it very easy to kind of uh, create very, very, or not very, but like more complex ways of hiding messages, which is important over the internet because we're sending packages of information back and forth to one another through these communication networks. Um, so this is important to say that like cryptocurrency, which is now when most people say crypto, they mean cryptocurrency, um, is built on kind of many of the different innovations that have been come out, that have come out of cryptography. Um, and so they use cryptography in order to, the original intention, of course, with Bitcoin was like, how do we make peer-to-peer -peer cash without needing a centralized entity to run it? Um, and so like, while I don't think that they really made money per se, they made a interesting money-like digital system where you can send and receive Bitcoin uh, cryptographically which is a very difficult thing to do because if you think about the internet, think about computers, they're essentially giant copying machines, like information copying machines. When I make an email and I send you an email, like your email client is making a copy of the email that I sent. It's not like, you know, me sending a letter that's like physically going to you. Like my email that I sent, I still know what I sent because it's in my client. Um, and so when you're wanting to create a money-like system, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if like, my dollar is just being copied over to your dollar client on your computer, you know, is defeating the purpose. And that's a very, so it's a very difficult uh, problem to solve. It's called the double spending problem. 
Um, and so with a different combination of different cryptographic techniques, um, you know, the creator of Bitcoin like kind of solved this problem to, to a large extent. Um, and so, yeah, now since then, there's been this large explosion of uh, people speculating on this. Now we, we treated this something that was meant to be like money into basically like a, some sort of speculative asset, which money is not really a speculative asset. Um, and have built like n more and more and different features for different blockchains, which is just the name for the the most common used form of data infrastructure or data structure uh, for crypto. I, I want to say one thing that money is in many ways uh, a speculative asset, and there are a lot of uh, libertarians will post this uh, this like what happened in 1972 website. That's like it's the, all these charts of all these bad things that happened in 1972, which is when we went off the gold standard which is what they say is the reason that, oh, we need to get back on real money. And They're not money neoliberal and economic work. policy. Well, it's the neoliberal economic policy, but it's, it's also the fact that we started trading money on the markets. Money markets were opened up. Mm. And so Adam Curtis talks about this in one of his documentaries, maybe hypernormalization or maybe all watched over by machines, love and grace. I don't know which one it is, but basically money itself started to be traded on the open markets, money for money. And so there is incentive for traders to, you know, short sell for currencies of whole countries and things like that and to buy this money and buy that money. It's some it, enormous amount of the amount of transactions that happens in our world today is just in the, the money markets in money for money. It's something like 97%. I'm not Don't quote me on that. I'll link a really good video with, I think, Nigel Dodd or someone like that talking about it. But uh, money itself as a commodity is a speculative asset and it, it has a fluctuating value that can be you can profit off of that you can buy low and sell high so yeah i mean we could get into all kinds of talks about the existing problems with money um but i, I think zooming out a little bit into the gathering that we're at here the crypto commons that this isn't just about currency it isn't just about creating money like substances uh it's about a whole lot more you know i mean mm. there have been taught i missed most of the talks but there were talks about transcending the nation state there were talks about uh, bioregional governance about uh, new forms of of currency that aren't money like which might seem like a stretch to people or you know we could get into discussing that you just i actually helped you film a talk last night with art brock of holochain mm -hmm. and there are some of the some of the the g's out there that are really working on that infrastructure to make things like mutual credit currencies uh, we were talking about uh, currency as something that isn't just money like a college diploma is a currency like you know energy moving through a system can be a current that you see and you remark it and say you know we're logging and accounting this sort of flow i'm kind of getting lost on a tangent here but, <laughs> but, but like there were i think a lot of the things that people are interested in here is kind of like breaking apart um or deconstructing like this idea that money is the only currency that exists yeah. or like any that like has monolithic ability to uh, measure the flows of value or of anything else like in society that we in fact um, I mean one we do have many different types of currencies in many ways that like Arthur Brock uh, talks a lot about um, and so like the I think with cryptocurrency the double spend problem is not a problem about money per se right it's like how do you create something with a very with a particular um property uh as like digital bits right you it's the same problem with voting right you don't want to have a system where if the intention is that everybody gets one vote you don't want like people to vote as many times as they want if you want like a truly democratic system or um, for somebody to have more voting power than others Sure, or which, which is know. really the, the problem with the whole vote with your dollars thing, because if you're voting with your dollars and like that's a ridiculous 99 percent of the money is, and wealth is owned by one percent of the population, like your votes just don't mean shit, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I think like um, yeah. So I mean, I think uh, so. Getting to this idea of the commons, right? The commons is like a type of resource where it's still potentially scarce, um, but is openly available, publicly available for many people to use, there's a need for governance over those resources. Yeah. And so governance in cryptographic systems 
um, also has this problem of double spend potentially. Like you, if you want to encode rules for how you are governing your resources, your whether those be purely digital or or physical, um, like you need a system that people can trust that will not, you know, allow for people to to break it. You know. Yeah, I mean, benefits. and that seems to be the overarching um, pattern in all of these projects and the, the people that are here working on this is basically creating a system that isn't corrupted from the start. Our monetary system is corrupted from the start. Its inherent rules and gravitation produce inequality mathematically. They produce uh, patterns of extraction and environmental destruction and disconnection and separate, separation within their own logic and rule set. And our governance systems are exactly the same. And so the idea here isn't just that we're gonna create a new kind of money, although that's a big part of it. And <laughs> there have been so many just phenomenally interesting ideas about that, like the economic space program, they were talking about uh, fluid value staking, which is like, it's just, it's so great being here because I've been like getting into this sort of rethinking money world and stepping backwards from like money is bullshit, no money into like, what are the transitionary steps? How do we turn the existing thing that is money into something that so fundamentally alters it and creates new feedback loops and patterns of behavior and changes that it unmakes itself with itself. But I've been talking for a long like months, the last few months I've had these ideas about like, well, what if, you know, in a mutual credit system and mutual credit is, well, can, you, can you define mutual credit? Sure. I mean, it's basically um, mutual credit rather than the way that we think about money now is that you either like have it or you don't for the most part. You know, you have like five dollars or you have zero dollars, um, even though in the background there are like there are you know things like loans where you can have like a negative net worth or whatever. Um, but mutual credit is a more like uh, explicit acknowledgement that uh, uh, that like basically giving the ability to create money to everyone. Is how I like to think about it's, it. And it's a steady state system as well. It's not, right. it's not inflationary or deflationary. Right. So you don't have like this supply problem per se necessarily, like in the same way, I guess. Um, where it's where everyone in, a, you know, a, whatever system that you're using this currency starts at zero. Um, and you would then uh, be able to, if you, anybody can sort of spend their credits um, towards something, they would pay someone else. So if I pay you, I would have negative five and you would have plus five. So I would be in the negative, um, but, you know, I would be a part of this system or a group of people where I have a job or I'm doing whatever work and people are paying me as well. And over time, we're kind of like um, averaging around zero more or less. Um, there could be different institutions that are part of our system that may be like more likely to be higher or lower because of like the way that they work within the system. But um, more or less, everybody has the ability to to go to zero. Yeah. Um, and being at zero is not a bad thing. Yeah, it, which is a fundamentally different kind of social relationship. I mean, it's it requires trust. It is uh, something that is, it, it emanates not from nothing, but from the promises and from the uh, decisions and interrelationships of community. So for me, I think that represents a really big step toward uh, a sane way to coordinate and to deal with our interactions one to one. I was going to say that um, the staking, oh fuck, it's all so complicated. It's like <laughs> I asked the uh, uh, Jorge of the Economic Space Program like to explain their system, and he was like, "Fuck, man, it's like explaining the uh, Apollo space rocket. It's very like, it's so complicated. It, it's beautifully uh, ornate and intricate, and I just I find a lot of um, like geometry and poetry in the way that." people in this sort of engineering and system science and programming um, community thinks about these things. We're, we're not going to be able to get all the little details about value staking and all this stuff, but we'll definitely be doing, um, I will be personally investigating these things more and making more media about them and forming more partnerships with people in these communities. <laughs> I think it's really important for people to realize that economics is not just um, about tokens. It's not just about stuff like products and services and business it is basically the system of how we make decisions in society and who gets what and how we decide who gets what and so the value system uh comes out of that there have been there's been a consistent refrain in conversations here that 
um, everyone here really understands and is working with this in mind that our consciousness is shaped by our technology and by the mediums that we interact with, the way that we exchange value with each other in this exchange paradigm of I'm not you and you're not me, you go to the store and you buy a candy bar, you slap your coin down, there, that's no trust involved. There's no relationship between you and that other person. So that small act reinforces a value system and a behavior. Yeah, yeah. And so what we're really doing here and why this is so radical and, and for me so refreshing because it's not just theory, it is theory directly applied to design. So we're designing new information systems, new technological systems to facilitate not just the flow of resources, but the flow of information, the flow of trust, you know, and, and we're a lot of these people are, are starting to actually measure these things and starting to say we want to diversify the way that we're making these calculations in society where right now it's just money. Money is the only thing. Money is everything. Mm. But if we realize that, we can start to change it. We can alchemize it into something new and different and by changing those relationships um, and changing our technologies we can change ourselves and the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think that's uh, that's one of the steps necessary for sure <laughs> one of the big ones <laughs> well um what what are what are some like uh some of the insights that you've gotten from this company we, we've had a lot of great talks and conversations and mm. and uh it's been nothing but fucking phenomenally high-flying interesting people <laughs> talking and sharing yeah i mean this conference has been interesting because now this is the um third installment so like we had you know the first one in which not many people really knew each other they didn't know kind of like what to expect they didn't know like you know felix and julia kind of invited us to this place um and it was kind of like Everybody was throwing their ideas all over the place, and now this is the third installment, so things have solidified a bit more. There's now, you know, at least for the people who have come back, uh, there's been like a, a reinforcement of our relationships and like now a shared understanding and like context that all of us have to where um, we have been able to, I mean, maybe we get there, we have been able to get like more nonsensical because now we have like inside jokes and we have like, <laughs> but, but, but more importantly, we have like shared understanding about like, like we know what the commons are. We know what like mutual um, credit is. We know like yeah. we have a lot of shared sort of definitions about things. And I think, I felt like this conference was um, more mature because of that. So we were able to like, I think, get fairly deep on on a few things which is really nice it was it was very um satisfying and uh affirming for me in my own novice sort of like research my own uh late night obsessions to be able to come in late in the game and be able to keep up um you're talking about something about the this is a very special space um yeah watch that light okay um i, I kind of want to maybe back up a little bit into we're dealing with tech difficulties. I just, just went on a, a blistering rant about um, post-capitalism. Yeah. Um, why don't we kind of pull back there and, and define post-capitalism? Um, I mean, for me, post-capitalism can be, it is, I mean, first and foremost, the acknowledgement that capitalism will end, whether we like want it to or not, eventually, you know, all things come to an end and, um, there is kind of like, of course, post-capitalism can be post-capitalism as in we're in like, you know, apocalyptic kind of uh, <laughs> Mad Max uh, future scenario. But I would really much rather that it go towards a more, um, uh, e towards a more egalitarian future uh, where we are relying less on capital uh, in a democratic way to get away from kind of capital as like the main power relationship that drives economic activity in in our society and capitalism. Um, so yeah, so for me, like, um, I don't, I don't know if this was, uh, I talked about this, but I don't remember if it, it was, uh, in the, from the cutoff, but like, there's a need to kind of identify like what is the post capitalist subject or what is the, the person, what do they, what do they want and what do they do in post capitalism? Like what is, you know, five minutes after the revolution, what does your world look like? Um, yeah. where capitalism is officially done. We've pressed the big red button. Capitalism is finally over. <laughs> what does that look like? And I think, at least for me, I mean, one, it means getting rid of capital 
uh, as the main source of um, of economic power because capital is a way that essentially essentially billionaires and large corporations are the economic planners of society. They have econo- they have planned you know uh, the way that the world works today. If a billionaire company wants to make a million widgets, they just assign the capital for a widget factory in the cheapest place they can find, and labor will move there. They can make they, it, it's like magic for resources to move, right? Um, and so I think in order to get away from this, there's a need to essentially democratize the economy, that we need to involve more people to have the ability to give their voice about what should and should not be the type of, um, you know, how they would use their resources. Yeah, um, I don't know exactly what all we missed <laughs> in that cutoff. Um, Two ideas I think are really essential is that um, the economy or economics is not just money. It isn't just, you know, business. It isn't just shopping and stuff. It is the codified sort of relationships between people in terms of power, in terms of decision making, in terms of who gets what and how we make it and where it comes from and our relationship to nature, our relationship to each other. It's the management of the household. And the ability to recognize that is the ability to step into our agency to change it. And until we do that, you know, as long, so long as we're in this space of capitalism, which is uh, not just an economic philosophy, it is not just a way of doing business, a way of you know incentivizing people. It is a consciousness. It is this thing that has been reinforced through this medium of money and the technologies the environments, the places, the spaces that we interact with as mediums shape our consciousness. Our environment dictates mm. our behavior, our material conditions, create the, the, the mentality that we take into the world. And so the human being is very fluid. We're very adaptive and changeable. And we have been forced through, squeezed through this tube of this one very narrow way of being where more and more and more all the time is, uh, goes through this lens of uh, accumulation of competition of dominance because these are necessities in this system and so uh, I think that in the spirit of changing that creating new tools and systems that allow more people's voices to be heard that allow us to gain uh, more of an insight and an understanding of the flows of resources of energy of will of I'm doing good I'm doing bad <laughs> with many many red buttons that we push many times through the day but I don't think that there is one big red button that we will push that will bring about this revolution that will sweep across the world instantaneously. I think it's, it's more like we will create multiple feedback loops in terms of new structures of organization. There will be apps that will unmake capitalism, you know. Um, but it, more than anything, the space of post-capitalism is in a way the space of pre-capitalism, which is the, the mentality of the commons and the gift. It is us interacting with each other as each other, as extensions of each other. And so this place specifically is a beautiful example of that, of the commons, of a common shared space. There are people who work here, there are people who own, there are people who are paid to be here, but really everyone that has been in this space through this event and structure has very fluidly interacted and accessed the space as something that is shared, something that we all access collectively. The kitchen is not owned by anyone in particular. There's not a boss of the kitchen. There's not a servile worker in the kitchen washing the dishes. Even the head funders of this place are in there peeling potatoes and washing dishes. So we're all participating in the work of society. And we're in that space of the commons that is the shared space of humanity. We breathe the same air. We have the same shared set of ideas and values. We know intuitively when we're out of this separatized, I'm me and I'm the only one and I'm just like me and there's no one else out there and I'm in, it's incommunicable. The space that is the mentality of capitalism where we forget that the pain that you feel when you feel pain is the pain that I feel. The love that you feel when you feel love is the love that, that we feel. We have a shared understanding of reality. We know that when we eat food, we're going to poop it out. You know, we have this base of understanding that is collective and shared. And that is the space of post-capitalism. That is the space of the now. I mean, I would say it's the space where most people live for most of their lives. They don't know it yet. And it's just a matter of finding those places, those people, those experiences, and expanding them into more and more and more areas of our life as, as we kick capital out. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, post-capitalism requires, you know, an optimistic post-capitalism requires... Um, an increase in collective intelligence, just the ability for people to know 
what is the current state of society, where is their place in it, and like to know that hey, right now, like I know that people are hurting,、um, and there are like things that I can do meaningfully in order to like reverse that, to change that、um, within my context.、Um, so yeah, so I think、uh, that has a lot to do with、um, the crypto world being. You know, blockchains and distributed ledger technologies being this kind of like、um, shared ledger, like shared understanding of what is going on, so everybody can kind of refer to and have like knowledge about the fact that this or that is happening, and you know this or that proposal or this or that vote, and people are leaning towards this or that, so we can have a uh, a more、um, shared understanding of reality rather than our hyper. Like what capitalism, I think, has done is like split people like incredibly to to an extent that people really they experience reality differently and they see the world very. We can get the same set of facts, and somebody else can like think completely different of it, and that has I think a lot to do with like priming people. Like in capitalism, like a very common strategy for marketing is splitting the market. That、so、you create like.、Um, You know,、uh, sort of particular identities around、uh, commodity consumption, essentially,、uh, to like create the type of consumer you want,、yeah. um, and then like all these other things become packaged within it. That like, of if you know one thing says this, then it means like it's a right coded thing or it's a left coded thing or whatever else, and this has caused a lot of problems, obviously. Yeah, I mean, the separation and the division is is the essential. Philosophical underpinning, I think, the separation of individualism of I'm me and I'm not you, and, and money reinforces this, like trade reinforces this. Quid pro quo, I'm going to do this for you and you do this for me, and then we're done. You know, like that. That is the severing of that bond, of that cohesion of trust that builds up over time. I think it, it, it's um it's it's powerful. An insight for me in the past several months has been that、um, ending accounting.、Uh, well, so we're we're. Our organization, group, movement, ethos is: we want to move beyond money. You know, fundamentally, we want to move beyond exchange as the way that we meet our needs. As humans lived from the majority of our history, we did not trade pieces of paper, or we did not trade cows for chickens to meet our basic needs. We did things collectively. We did them in a shared way, and、uh, that's the overarching intention and goal. We want to get, you know, through to a gift economy or an economy of sharing. An economy where we are collectively involved in each other's lives, and there isn't this energy loss of exchange and trade and business, and you know, this is, these are just primitive, very primitive ways of、uh, of engaging as we see it. But it's also important to recognize two things: one, that we're in a transitional space away from that world of money, where everything is money, every fucking thing costs money, everything is monetized and transactionable in this society, and so we have to transition through that. But also that. In thinking of money as an information system, there's a fantastic Alan Watts lecture about money where he's like,、uh, one of the problems in our world is the failure of one of our information networks, and it's called money. And、um, uh, I want to go inside in a minute here. I think <laughs> yeah, yeah I see stormed it. Out. I see storm moving in very、um, fast. I、now. can finish this point, and we can move inside and、uh, sure. record in there. Maybe more、see. people will be involved. It'll be more collaborative. <laughs> But basically, that that we don't. Beat money by just stopping accounting. I do think we need to stop the transactionalism of like I give you this for you, give each other money. We need to be gifting more and taking the transaction out and stopping this conditionality of like I'm going to do this for you because this. But it's like our ability to、uh, add more streams of accounting, add more currencies that we are measuring, that we are making account of, more ledgers of、uh, amalgamations of the data and information of like how we're doing, what we're eating, how we're spending, you know. That's that's the power that、um, crypto and AI and oh my god and it's coming down. Okay, <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> we'll pick this up in a minute, gang. Hey friends, we'll return to the main conversation in just a moment. But we're taking this quick break to ask: Do you want to do something about all the issues we talk about here on our show? Do you want to learn more, get involved, and help us help others break out of the cycle? Step one is to join the growing community of rebels and kind hearts sharing their knowledge and passion. Follow Moneyless Society on our social media pages and spread the message to people who need it. When you're ready, you can get involved by reaching out and becoming a Moneyless Society volunteer. We need every skill imaginable, large or small, if we're going to resist the powers destroying our planet. 
And even if you don't have time to volunteer, you can help us build the dream with donations of any size. We create all of this community and content because it is our passion, but we need resources to get it done. Monthly Patreon donors receive cool perks like early access to future episodes, and visitors to our website, moneylesssociety.com, can buy MOSO shirts and other merchandise that help spread awareness. We're glad you're here, and we hope that you'll keep learning and growing with us. The goal may seem far away, but we can get there together. I knew the Commons Hub was a special place when I got here because the Moneyless Society book by our own Matt Holton was already on the shelf. And as this is a dual pod, if this episode's content is more interesting to you, I highly recommend Joshua DeVilla's book, Blockchain Radicals, How Capitalism Ruined Crypto and How to Fix It. Okay. So we are uh, back in the flow. Yeah. After a little bit of interruptus, after two interruptuses, well, back in the comments. Um, you're you're the host now. You're, you're the host <laughs> I'm the host now too. Yeah. Well, I'm curious for you. What what is your um, what are your main learnings trying to not live with money? Well, I don't try not to live with money. Um, I've tried to live with money and failed horribly. Uh, and when I try to live for money or with you know. Like, I need money to live, you know. Yeah. Well, it's minimizable. I don't. I don't actually. If I had absolutely no money, I would be able to live because I would find friends, basically. I would make friends with people wherever I was, like when I was hitchhiking and traveling. I would, like, very instinctually, like, uncannily, like, gravitate toward my people. Like, I, th- I b- really believe like there's something to like there are frequency receptors in our body that are seeking like the vibes of other people. I'm not going to go down a hippie rabbit hole there, but I was able to drift like m- quite miraculously toward people and then connect with them just by being vulnerable and open and trusting and they reciprocate that. I mean, there was one guy in Baton Rouge where I had no um, place to sleep. I just got into this town. I didn't know a single soul. I was at a bar. And I just walked up to a complete stranger and I was like, hey man, here's the thing. Um, I am traveling. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on an adventure and I don't have a place to stay and I don't know this town. Um, can I stay on your couch? And I, I was like, here's a, here's a picture of my ID. You can take a picture of it and send it to your grandmother just to make sure I don't kill you or something. And I, you know, he laughed and we started to kind of talk. He was like, well, yeah, you know, let's talk about it. And we just, we, we had a shot and we talked and we connected. And within five minutes, he was like, yeah, sure, I'll stay on my couch. Mm. So we can always find our ability to meet those needs. Like one of the most beautiful moneyless exp- projects I've ever seen wasn't like some AI, um, you know, control system that, uh, you know, managed resources. And there was a system that was automated. And it was a group of people without houses who organized a community in Echo Park in LA uh, in the pandemic. And they had a beautiful like tent community in this beautiful park and they had help from other people in the community and they all worked together and um, at one point they were paying they were making donations and they were paying people and they found that it destroyed their motivation so they stopped Mm. they were like fuck it we don't want the money we really don't they had a community garden but they created a thriving beautiful moneyless community which is how they meet their needs community it's the the fucking mode of production community and uh, the state smashed it up and you know destroyed it and threw their tents in the trash and arrested people and uh, but uh, I I'm not I, I don't think people should just go out and give up money. I mean, well actually I do I think everyone should should spend at least some time in their life trying to live without it and even go on one adventure go hitchhike go couch surf go find what your role is in society without money when there is no money because mm. you don't truly know yourself if you can just pay for everything. Right. There is no freedom, really, when everything's behind a paywall. No. And it's, no. An, it's an illusion of freedom to think that if you're rich and you have enough money to step over the paywall, that you're still free because you're still living in this horrible conditionality. I mean, even billionaires are working like 60 hours a week. Like, that's not a free person. That's not freedom. And I really believe we're not free until we all are. And especially with the worsening inequality and the public health epidemic of violence and crime and shootings and, and, uh, of course, the pending climate apocalypse that's going to happen if we don't learn to share. 
that it affects all of us directly, that the effects of this monetary system and the separation at, at its core are driving uh, humanity apart. They're, just, they're splintering and destroying organized life and reducing it to its simpler evolutionary forms, like, like we're reducing the earth to a rock, to a dead thing, because of our ultimate belief in this thing, money, that we think we need money, that I went on this little rant recently on Instagram, it was like, that we have to ask money for permission to live. Mm. Like, I, the term, the cost of living, like I feel like I think people don't internalize how Ghastly. fucked up that is. <laughs> the <Ghastly>. cost to live. <laughs> yeah. Life itself is not free. As my great friend Aisha, a woke scientist, uh, said, I interviewed her and on our podcast, that like no creature in this world is intrinsically allowed to exist. Even nature. Mm. Nature has to earn its keep. Humans have to earn their keep. Buckminster Fuller was, was a, bu a brilliant person to point out that this specious notion that we have to earn our right to live is, is obsolete. That we need to send people back to doing what they were doing before they uh, had to go and get a job. Mm. You know, the work of being human is work. Like when I was traveling and I was, you know, in hitchhiking with people in their cabs, I was working. I was providing a service for them even mm. as I was gaining service for them, which for me was learning, like, listening. I mean, I talk as much as I talk. Maybe I'm not the best listener, but being able to deeply listen to people and to give them insight into their problems and to give them perspective that they would never have because they're inside of their life. You want to be in a podcast with us? Sure. Cool. <laughs> Hang on one second. I'm talking about Pecco. Pecco, come be in the podcast. Come on. You're like the most interesting person in the room right now. Thanks, bruv. <laughs> well, we all are. Offensive. Our collective hey, intelligence. Myself, too. But, but look, it, geometrically, Sorry, geometrically, we need one more person here. It's, it's going to be in balance. No, actually, because I'm sort of reserved. I have to have a... Well, you can just listen. Drink beer. Okay, all right, all right. Yes. Um, I'm just kidding for fags. <laughs> um, let's see, how do we... we got to share. We're going to have to share in my here. Here, let's, let's trade places. Post capital. Also gotta shuffle. be also gotta be careful with the when I gotta leave for the train. Oh well, what time's that? Um uh, forty five or something like that. What uh, you're oh, you're you're the pretty floating host there. Yeah. No, no. I still need a pack. Forty five. Okay, what is uh <laughs> what what's the what's the question here? We're bringing him into the condo. Um I don't know, I mean, I've actually how have you found the CCG? Uh that's an interesting one. Was it something you expected? No, but I didn't expect much. Um, <laughs> how, did I, how did I experience CCG? Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah, I guess it was just kind of a mimetic brew, really. Uh, quite interesting stuff. Various um, various ideas coming at kind of the appropriate time. I found Leo particularly fascinating just because of what he was playing with, was speaking to my experience. Uh, I found yeah they also particularly fascinating as a lot of the stuff he covers is highly meta and uh, just fits a lot of the stuff I've been working with. Can you loop the audience in a little bit into what those uh, what those things that were being talked about were? Ooh, uh, so Leo was talking about the uh, the inter interfacing or the interpreters uh, that or interfacing interfaces I think is what he's talking about or shapes interacting that change their shape through the interaction. Uh, this is kind of like meta generalization of life experience reality, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so uh, I guess he was kind of getting up into the meta for that. Um, and yeah, I, I dug uh, the poetics that came out of the machine were particularly beautiful, not that I can remember those. Uh, Yellow then on state box and applied Capri theory also felt uh, pretty resonant to me in the sense that it was a way of uh, bounding complexity and uh, kind of limiting limiting the complexity in order to ensure kind of effective processes. Uh, and so uh, we talked about, I, I've got these mandalas, which I've shown you both at this point, not that the listeners here can, can see, but um, we were talking about those in relation to state box wiki or process wiki, and then the breaking of symmetries to create processes, um, and thus the complexities bound in the sense that you've already bound it in the mandala and you're just breaking into symmetries, right? Um, 
Go ahead. Well, we, we were just talking about uh, the structures in society and the technologies that create the consciousness that we have. And mm -hmm. We were talking last night. I was looking at interfacing, your notebook. Interfacing. I was, I was like, what are, you, what are you into? And you're like, this kind of shit. And you open up your notebook and it was like all these mandalas. And I was like, oh, I love shit like that. Mm -hmm. But you were, you were um, basically taking notes and organizing things into these patterns yeah. of geometric patterns and shapes that kind of, um, when you look at them, you... It produces a, an organizational sort of matrix in the brain that you think about things in a different way. So, yeah, yeah that's that's been a really interesting um, through line here is, is the way that the mediums that we interact with. Uh, they shape our experiences. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking at one shape versus another, that's changing you in the kind of process of structural coupling as you interact with your environment, you're changed by it, which gets into your discussion on post-capitalist systems. And, uh, <laughs> in order to actually effectively escape the meme of capitalism, then you actually need to escape it, which is kind of a transcendental trap because you need to couple with that structure outside of the capitalistic system. And so we've got all these different communities trying all these different things in order to just create enough of a gap to transition. Uh, for anybody watching here, every single conversation with every single person <laughs> here has been that interesting. Um, and I just want to remind people that your people are out there, that one of my mandates and missions in life is find the others. Find them. They are out there. And if you have an idea of how the world should be changed, chances are absolutely, without a doubt, you are not the only one thinking about it. Chances are there are people who are actually further down the rabbit hole. Like I was at a conference the other day talking about, you know, these beautiful um, direct economic democracy systems. And I asked the, the guy, like, talking to him, giving the presentation, who else is working on this stuff? And he was like, no one. And I kind of raised an eyebrow, like, because I knew people who were working on that shit, you know? <laughs> and I think we have to ask the the question like am i alone in this instead of this kind of ted kaczynski kind of attitude where it's like i'm the only one who thinks this way i'm an, i'm a loner to go off into the woods and write your manifesto instead of working with other people bringing in more feedback you know mm. it's a bit of both it's the harmonic recursion of whole and part right and so where the whole where the parts are simultaneously <laughs> holes embedded in other holes that are also a part <laughs> True. I'm gonna to have to interview you separately. <laughs> I've loved our talk so much. No, no. Oh, oh okay, okay. I got that. I got that. Anyway. All right. That was good. Goodbye. It was, it was fun. A small taste. A taster of. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was the <laughs> conversations are like. I was hoping more people would, would uh, rush in as we go here, but I don't know if we have that much that much time left here. But um, you're 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 in the driver's seat here. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, for you, how did I'm curious, like, what for you was it that made you rethink? Crypto, I guess a bit. I, I I'm assuming like probably beforehand you might have been dismissive of it because of its speculative nature. What was it for you that was kind of like the the switch? Because for a lot of people, I think it is it is quite difficult, and for me, it's still difficult to find out how to help people have that switch. That's why I like to ask people how how for them it happened because I'm still well, trying to figure it I, out. I think again, it was that moment of realization that like all money is a monkey picture. Like, George Washington is a fucking monkey, and we have this piece of paper that represents value that's like, that's an NFT. Like, the original NFT is land ownership, you know? Mm. Like, I don't know. I, I just, I am in a relentlessly cooperative phase, which I hope is not a phase, of seeking solutions desperately, because I am brutally aware of how fucking dire our situation is. And I'm really tired of seeing the insulation and isolation between all these different cliques and groups and people that aren't working together to solve problems collectively, collaboratively. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking at things in their own way and they're, they're talking about all these silver bullet solutions like, this is the answer, this is the solution. I was at a, a farm recently with this guy who's just all about Bitcoin, obsessed with Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. He worships it like a god. He yeah. thinks like this is the thing we need to change society is this uncorruptible ledger and and it was just really trying to get him to understand like there's parts of what you're talking about that are needed that are important that are true instead of just being like oh he's a bitcoin guy fuck him it's right. like we have to cooperate to save our lives and so um i don't know part of it is actually interacting with people who are in the spaces in the region space who are talking about regenerative finance and you know we're trying to work with the existing systems and alchemize them. I don't know when it, it was a shift, but I just, I, I don't want to be uh, close-minded in anything 
I want to be open to any idea. And if anybody is out there saying, this is a solution to the global problems that are going to fucking kill us all, I will listen. If a crazy dude on the street comes up to me with a stack of papers and says, this is my plan to save the world, I will read it. Maybe mm. not the whole thing, but I will give it, I will, I will give it a chance, you know? Right. And so, yeah, it's been, it's been really, um, it's been really great finding this community, you know, first as kind of an outsider, a little skeptical. I was skeptical of Moneyless Society at first because they didn't seem to have a lot of grounding in, in the Facebook group that we, that I joined that became this larger thing, um, that they didn't have class analysis or that they lacked some piece of green anarchist theory or whatever the fuck I was into at the time. But I pushed through that skepticism to see like, oh, actually, if I investigate these people's analysis, it's very, very thorough. They have a, a deep understanding and know more than I do in a lot of instances. But I think that that underlying principle is that we need to work together with um, all peoples, not all peoples, but any peoples, um, to transition from whatever structure we're stuck in and connect in the systems, you know, because we need everybody. We need, honestly, this is going to be a controversial statement, but to bring about a transition to post-capitalism, we need capitalists. We need to change those people's minds who have access to resources and money. Like me, personally, I don't live without money for cho as a choice. I just don't know how to make money. So for me to connect with people who have money and believe in the things that I'm saying and the projects that I'm doing and the film that I'm making and all that stuff and support me helps me more than most things. Like, I'm quite self-contained. I'm, I'm a crazy little uh, explorer. I can in survive in any environment. I can socialize my way through anywhere, any place I've ever been. I know exactly what I'm doing everywhere I'm going, even if I don't know where I'm going or why. But I need physical support for things like airlines and trains and, you know, hostels and food. And, you know? Of course, yeah. And you have to pay for it. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, there's not much way out. Yeah. Yeah, but I think this, I mean, for me, when I think about the capital is a relationship instantiated in an object. Like it's either in the money form or commodity form, most likely, right? The, the general sort of like formula of capital, if you know, like MCM prime, like you have money then you turn it into a commodity, which you then sell for more money. Yeah. So like part of the um, breaking of capital as a social relationship, um, at least in this formula, implies that there's a need to either break the commodity or break the money aspect. And of course, the commodities are nice because we can use them, and do shit with it. But the money part is sort of like this abstracted uh, kind of system of, of trade or a facilitation of trade within, at least as it exists today, in its form in this like social relationship. So I mean, I do applaud like trying to criticize that, that aspect and thinking about how we can do that more. Because like in your story with the guy that you asked if you could sleep on his couch, we have abundance. We have plenty. Yeah. There's enough for people more than enough. To, to meet their needs. And, and yeah, it's this power relationship that, that prevents us from doing it. I, I want to tell this little, uh, this little anecdote I've been kind of working up and thinking about lately that like the absurdity of the commodity, the absurdity of money. Imagine like someone you know, 2,000 years ago, or 5, 000, after 5,000 years ago. Someone 10,000 years ago goes up to the people in their village and they're like, I'm going to do magic. I'm going to do a magic thing. Watch me. Watch me turn this cat into a bag of potatoes. And they're like, okay, you're insane. You're a crazy person. You know, you're, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard, you know. Uh, but that's really what's happening when we... Uh, have the commodity form you know when something is a commodity it's like you have the cat and it's worth a certain number of uh, monkey pictures <laughs> <laughs> or coins or <coughs> or whatever and then you you have this calculating mechanism where you say this cat is worth this much it has this much utility or this much use value whatever you however you designate it and it's highly spec speculative it's, and things aren't worth what they're really worth an iphone should cost you know thousands of dollars if we accounted for the environmental externalities and the child labor that goes into making it and all this stuff. But I digress. So you have the cat, which is worth this number of monkey pictures. And then you you say, all right, someone comes up to you and they want that cat. And you say, all right, I'm going to sell it to you for this, number of, this amount of monkey pictures. Then you have those monkey pictures, which you can go and convert into potatoes or a thousand potatoes or whatever it is. And this is an insane wizardry. It is not <laughs> rational at all. 
There is maybe a rationale to it, a calculation that forms in our brains over time. It has been normalized so much that this is the foundation of society. This is how you do things, that it's, it's a desirable, good thing to be able to quantize and reduce reality to something that you can trade for, for other things. When everything is different and discreet and you cannot say that any number of potatoes is worth the value of a fucking cat, especially if it's something that's your pet, that's your friend, that you're connected to, that you have a, an infinitely qualitative relationship to. So I just think that in criti critiquing money in these forms, I don't think there's something that's always going to exist. Commodities or money or trade, they didn't exist for the majority of our existence. And people met their needs through community and through other means, through other relationships, other arrangements. Trade was something that you did with strangers, people that were like on the verge of being enemies. David Graeber says in the debt the first 5,000 years, this great line where he's like, a world based on trade is one that's forever predicated on violence. Like the fist is poised. The, the world based on trade is forever predicated on violence. The fist is poised, like we're always at each other's throats. It could break out at any time, this violence between each other, because what we're doing when we're uh, separating ourselves into this market paradigm and trading, trading, and trading is a violent thing. I mean, I, I was just in Colombia, and but people come up to you and they're like, buy this little shitty flute or buy this little thing, or like, they'll come out with a handful of candy, just bullshit. It has no value as an excuse to trade so that you can get their money. And when you say no, for my in my case, they assume I'm a white person, I have a lot of money, and yeah. in some ways I have a tremendous amount of more wealth than they do in terms of privilege, but I don't have that money, so I have to say no, and it's hostile. It's, ho it's a hostile arrangement. It's not this friendly, you know... I don't, whose phone is this? I have no idea. Someone's dad is calling them. Okay. Um, but yeah, this, this, this act that we think is so benign in trade, which uh, beyond just money uh, is hosting and is separate. And uh, in gift economies, like my friends, the Arwakos, who I just spend a lot of time with in Colombia, indigenous peoples that live without money. And they say very clearly, I asked them, why don't you live with money? And they basically said this long, incredibly beautiful answer of like, there are two worlds. There's a world of darkness and there is a world of light. There is a world of separation and, and conflict and competition. And there is a world of prosperity and, and community and they basically said, because we live without money, because we live with each other, because we live as equals, we live in the world of light. When they see each other, even if they're total strangers, there's like 60,000 of them, so uh, they immediately walk up to each other. They go into their mochia, they, go, they get a handful of coca, they put it in that other person's bag. That's not a trade. That's saying, I'm you and you're me. But when you do the, the money thing, <laughs> you mediate your values in this thing we think is so neutral. You are severing that connection and that trust. And you are, re mm. you are telling a story that I am separate from you. We are separate. And so I could go on for hours and hours and hours, and our show is hours and hours and hours of talking about why this thing we call money is this ultimately deluded uh, psychosis that is, is going to be the death of us all because it's an abstraction. It's absurd. It's an absurdity that we, have, that we think we need to ask permission from the market to save the world to transition off of energy systems that are destroying life as we know it. And this perpetual need to commodify, this need to sell more, this need for constant cyclical consumption and turnover and job growth, this, these, all these mechanics that are embedded into this system based around this thing we call money that is now phenomenally obsolete, especially with better information systems for accounting, resource flows, and, and energy, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the currencies of the actual scarce resources of our finite planet that we can, you know, account for in ways that are not accounted for in the system that externalizes them totally, that we can transcend this. We can create new things. And it's been a really beautiful thing being at this conference, seeing people taking those steps to like, how do we take money as it is and split it into these other currencies and these other systems? And we need something to account for things. We do need something like mutual credit to be able to facilitate um, value exchange in society and for people to account for things. Even though one of my favorite anecdotes from that book, Debt, is this Inuit guy who's like an anthropologist who fails at the hunt. And um, this Inuit dude brings him this like 800 pounds of meat, walrus mm -hmm. meat. And he's like, whoa, thank you so much. And he's like, don't thank me. Where I come from, we are human. We help each other. That's what it means to be human, is to help each other. It's not to uh, remark. It's not to take account of you owe me this and I owe you this. 
That's what makes us human. Mm. Yeah, I think um, generally there's like kind of like these three ways in which people, um, when you talk about like private property, um, property. There are like three kind of property relationships, I guess you can call them, that people generally think of. There's like uses, like being able to use it. Yep. There's like being able to destroy it and being able to profit use off of it. Yeah. And then being able to profit from it as well. Um, and I think it's David Graeber who kind of um, pointed out that maybe there is this fourth one. It's like this responsibility to care for something that actually, um, like if you, sp like that's like these three are kind of like property, private property generally uh, is thought about. Um, but the desire to care for something, like we pay for, for example, we, we would, people buy a pet, they spend money, and then they spend money to like feed the pet. Yeah. But it's not like you make money off of it. It's not like you, you don't profit off of it. And to profit off of, off of it would be ridiculous. And people don't really uh, like sell so like so much like wouldn't want to sell the pet that they like bought for their family yeah there's a really interesting maybe just uh, one last story about crypto and then maybe uh, we should head out but there's a project started by terra zero which is a art uh, group in berlin mostly and they had a pro they had an exhibit called flower tokens and essentially you could um at the exhibit buy a token that would give you the right to like you would own one of the flowers that were at the exhibit and there'd be like constantly this video ongoing and like you can kind of see like the health of the flower and that flower gives you the right to water the plant that's it just to water the plant um, but at the same time they had a marketplace going on where you could buy and sell these flower tokens so that you can buy a way to have a right to water the plant the marketplace didn't work out because the price that after someone had bought a flower token that they wanted to sell at was way too high. Because nobody wanted to get rid of their ability to care for a flower. Like completely against the kind of like homo economicus logic that we're generally taught in like Econ 101 or classical liberal economics that like um, we're like utility maximizers or whatever. Um, I think it just kind of like shows that there is this like need and like human desire to care for other things and to care for each other that is lost in oftentimes kind of like this uh, the way that we think about private property and capital generally as well. Yeah, the um, the third uh, form of, of ownership I think, which is Roman, is usufruct, and Murray Bookchin talked a lot about that, and I I think that the uh, the seriously wrong podcast boys talk a lot about that with their mm -hmm. library economy. We talk about that essentially. Jacques Fresco talked about that uh, with an access economy, or basically where you're accessing things, you're not owning them. Like most of the things here in the Commons Hub, like are accessed communally, where it's like, you, and I think this is a very beautiful, elegant um, transformation because it's like George Monbiot said really simply, like we can all have nice things if we just share them, like in the commons. That's what the commons is. Like there used to be communal water parks and theme parks and things like that that were sabotaged literally just because of racism, just so poor people, black people couldn't access them. And so we could be living in a world where we, we're all living in an extremely high standard of living. We all have extremely good services. We have good food, good health care, great transportation, beautiful housing. You know, we're all participating in the design and the facilitation and the care of that world. Uh, but we don't all individually need to own it. We don't all individually need to have a car. You know, we can have a system where we slash the number of cars on the road and you, access, you have access to a car when you need it. And most of the time you don't need it because you have access to the train. No one owns the train. You know, well, there's private companies that own trains, which is a fucked up thing. No one should be able to own a train. <laughs> but when you get on the train, it's like we're all sharing it. When you go into the kitchen, we're all sharing it, you know? So it's like we can all have a lot more if we just give up this neurotic, diluted, metaphysical belief that I own a flower or that I own a car or that I own my even, even own my own body, you know? Which is just something that's ultimately rented. So mm. little wrap up. I mean, I just think uh, it's, it's really great to connect with you and to connect with this community um, I'm just very excited to form more relationships and work more in these spaces and, and, and just do that work of like connecting more people who are trying to do the thing and save the world, change things and, <laughs> and evolve new systems and structures. And 
no matter if they are totally, if we totally align in all these ways, I mean, the space where we disagree is where the interesting conversations happen, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, yeah. there is, there is solutions are out there. You know, anybody who doesn't, who thinks at this point, not enough people get it, or there are no solutions, or there are no answers. You're not working hard enough to ask the questions and to seek and to look. You're just assuming that, that there's, there's blockchain socialists at this point. Like information explosion is so great that any kind of person you can imagine is out there, like applying X to Y and and synthesizing it into Z. And that's that's a beautiful thing to me, is this shared future that isn't a monolith, that isn't a monoculture. There are many <laughs> futures, there are many worlds possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate that you were able to come <laughs> at the sort of so towards good, the end so of, of, of the conference and yeah. you're able to, to see it and have a taste of it and share with others um, kind of like the stuff that we're doing and yeah, kind of the, uh, the weirdness of it all. <laughs> I'm glad we can get on camera. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to help push you to be on camera more as well. <laughs> this, this, this handsome face here, this guy, he, does, he wants to do audio only podcasts. Are you kidding me? You know, you heard that thing, you got a face for radio, you got a face for, <laughs> for podcast, you know. Well, yeah, it's just been really great to connect. I really found like uh, another piece of my home, which is, isn't a place. Like, I'm, I don't, that just doesn't intuitively make sense to me ever to like settle down in one place. I want to help build this global village of communities and cooperatives and, and uh, new systems that I can get, bounce around all over the world and, you know, know that anywhere that I go, it, that the regenerators are there, you know, the people are there. Mm. And the weirdness of it all is, is like the, that's the signal, that's the currency for me, is like synchronicities. Yeah. Like when things line up, like I know, like I'm going in the right direction. Nice. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Cut. Like and subscribe. Hit, 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 hit that bell. Uh, leave a comment and uh, donate to our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, me too. <laughs> yeah, I second um, that. <laughs> yeah, if this is gonna be like a dual pod, like, like I'm gonna, I'll give you a shout out. Follow Josh, <laughs> the blockchain socialist, on Twitter, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Donate to the Patreon. They're doing amazing work. They're making a documentary right now, traveling around the world, and um, and exploring other crypto projects, exploring the space of like this whole crypto future, this whole you know, Web three, this new technological paradigm. And uh, gotta support each other. Follow Money in Society. Support us. You know, we're working to uh, go against the grain here to create a new paradigm. We are putting food in people's bellies with local food programs. We have a volunteer group. We are starting a systemic support group for people to work on their feelings and and just get more into that space of like out of the individualization of your life. My life is mine, and my problems are mine, and I'm on my own. Into sharing more and commenting in all things. And of course, I'm here to shoot this movie, which is just getting absolutely out of hand, mind-blowing, amazing, beautiful, new worlds, possible, revolution is already happening, we're here, we're going to do this thing, we're not going to go extinct, <laughs> or if we do, we're going to go down swinging. All right. Yeah, we're going to go down having a good time at least. Cheers. <laughs> let's go play Smash Brothers. Yeah, let's go. A special shout out to one of my favorite places on planet Earth, the Commons Hub, and the Crypto Commons Association, the Commons Gathering, and all the associated projects, movements, and people in the collaborative finance and post-capitalist movement. This is a movement of people that isn't just theorizing, but they are programming their values both into new protocols, all kinds of transformative new systemic structures, but more than that, They're creating a place here where you can come and live in the post-capitalist present. We're going to be doing a lot of collaboration with them in the years to come, as they are one of the most aligned organizations that we've found. But uh, anybody who subscribes to our Patreon right now, you can get a really great little conversation with Julio, one of the heads of the organization, about collaborative finance, platform co-ops, radical sort of networked transition economies to build the fucking future today. Places like this are living proof. The solutions are out there. Go find them.